Is your team still coding in local environments? Why? Use DevCubbies instead. DevCubbies is the new cloud-native platform that allows you to spin up remote development environments in minutes. Code from any device with an internet connection. In Node, PHP, Java, Python, you name it. So no more hardware failures, boot times, and all those dongles. There's a better way. Head over to devcubbies.com and use promo code LETMECODE to get your first month of cloud coding free. Welcome to the Oh Hell No podcast, where I, Keisha Nicole, delivers a daily dose of passion, purpose, and struggle by interviewing people who are living their best life doing what they love. Here on this podcast, every Oh Hell No moment serves a purpose. Now let's get started with the show. Alright everyone, welcome to another episode of the Oh Hell No podcast. Today I have Erica Steele. She is a board certified naturopathic doctor with a passion to bring care back to healthcare. Okay, so we're going to talk about how she uses holistic medicine to help people feel better. And we're going to get all up in her personal life as well. Not too personal, but you know, (laughs) passion related, of course. Yes. So tell us, Erica, first of all, thank you for coming on the podcast and welcome to the Oh Hell No podcast. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. No problem. So what does a naturopathic doctor have to do in order to become a naturopathic doctor? Like what do you, what does school look like for you? Yeah. So school looks like, um, I, I actually have six degrees in my field. So I had kind of a longer path, I think than most, um, I, started off thinking I was going to go into psychology. And so I have an AS in psychology. And then from there, I transitioned um, into a bachelor's in natural healthcare sciences and just kind of learning the various modalities in natural healthcare. Um, Because of my upbringing, I had a real passion for um, laboratory diagnostics. And so I did a lot of education in that. I have a second bachelor's degree in alternative medicine. I have one doctorate degree in natural medicine, and that one is is more extensive on homeopathy um, and uh, different treatments within the use of of that acute care as well as chronic um, care conditions. Um, And then I have my naturopathic um, degree, and I have a master's in public health with an emphasis in complementary and alternative medicine, and I actually got that for legislation um, in the natural health care and medical freedom realm, which, you know, is coming in very handy nowadays. Um, so traditionally, though, a person, if they chose to go into the naturopathy field, um, they could do a four-year bachelor's um, in the biosciences, so like um, biology or biochemistry or chemistry or something of that regard, and then they would take a four-year doctoral uh, program in naturopathy. Now, I will say there is a distinction in this country uh, between naturopathic medical doctors and naturopaths. There are naturopathic medical schools where a person goes and learns a little bit of allopathic medicine, like a little bit of drug therapy and surgery, and then a little bit of natural health care. Um, I am not one of those doctors. I chose to be um, exclusive to naturopathy because I really believed in um, Dr. Menedek Lust, who is our founder, who brought naturopathy from Germany um, in the late 1800s and early 1900s. I really believed in his principles of nature cure. Um, The physician is there to serve as a teacher for their patients and teach, educate on prevention, um, using nature in order to help facilitate healing within the body um, and and several of those other principles. So um, that is is in general um, how a person could become a naturopath if they so chose. Nice. So there are so many incurable diseases that we hear about like cancer, AIDS, um, lupus, like all types of things. Why do you feel about, like I read things that people say, 
well, some of these things are curable if you take a natural route or you do things, if you change your diet, if you live different, and then you have doctors who say, well, no, you need to take medication. That's the only way you're going to get better. What are your thoughts? Well, I, I first want to kind of bring a distinction to, you know, allopathic medicine, meaning like your standard you know, Western medical doctor that you would go to, their role is to look for and identify and diagnose a disease. And then once they've diagnosed that disease, then they um, treat it based off of using pharmaceuticals or surgery um, or procedures if those are available. And so in the allopathic realm, um, you know, it's very lacking in the curative space. Um, because they're, they're not necessarily trained that the body can heal itself. With that being said, as a naturopath, that is our belief that the body can heal itself if it's given the right environment. But our focus is not on curing the disease. Um, our focus is on helping the person become more empowered in their health and really trusting in the body's innate wisdom and ability to heal itself. And once the body begins to heal itself, then the propensity towards disease diminishes. So it's the bot, we depend on the body's ability to self heal, rather than going after and chasing after symptoms, or trying to fix a disease, etc. People, especially in this country, they get very caught up in the diagnose and manage model. And I think it's because they're looking for answers. They're not feeling well, they're looking for answers. They're not necessarily getting those answers from more of a traditional doctor. And so they seek out, I mean, even coming into my office, as I explained, naturopaths, we don't diagnose disease. That's not our job. And, you know, they're like, well, if I just had a label, if I just had a name of this, and it's like, even if you had a name, it doesn't improve the function of your organs and the function of your body. And that's really what we want to be striving for is improving the function of our bodies so that our bodies are able to self-heal. Wow. I love that you um, said that because a lot of people don't know that. Like I didn't know that, you know, so that's really interesting information. So like if I went to the doctor, like I have lupus, right. And thank God my lupus is not bad. Like it's very controlled and I'm fine. But if I went to like you per se, you would be working with me to help me to be at my best health so that I could take care of my body so that uh, maybe I, I wouldn't have flare ups and things like that. Is that how it works? Yeah. So how it works is a person comes to my office. I um, consult with them, understand their lifestyle habits. I will run um, laboratory on them. So I'll run like a lab panel. I'll evaluate that panel. I create a 30 something page report with a basic panel that somebody would get, let's say at a primary care visit. Um, We run our labs and then we determine, you know, what the causes are. And the causes typically are nutrient deficiencies in the body, accumulated toxins, overall organ health and function and areas of prevention. And so then looking at kind of that general overview, I then break it down into a step-by-step plan and I educate you on what your numbers look like and how we can go about improving your numbers. So everything that we do is based off of data and based off science. Um, And that's why I love what I do because it's not theoretical. It's not like generalized information. It's very specific and very intimate and very bio-individual to the actual person. So even though you come in and you have a diagnosis of lupus, your treatment plan could be potentially very different than let's say another person who comes in with that same diagnosis. And that's because your genetics are different. So I'm trained in genetics and methyl genetics. So looking at the foundation of the body. And then we also look at the environment because genetics only accounts for less than 30%. The rest is environmentally driven. The rest is what you're putting those cells in and those that pertains to lifestyle habits. So we look at things like your nutrition, what you're eating, but not just what you're eating, how you're digesting and assimilating that. That's where the biochemistry comes in. That's where supplementation comes in. I'm not a big over supplementer, meaning that I don't believe in giving people a whole bunch of supplements and calling it a day. I would rather work with the body's ability to heal rather than trying to force the body to do whatever it is that I want to do. We detoxify organs. So um, because of our environment and the toxicity levels within our environment, um, there's a 
a lot of toxins that are just floating around that unfortunately find in ourselves in our bodies, um, even in the womb, even in utero, they, they have studied this. Um, so we work to detoxify, but then also too, because it's holistic, you know, we look at your relationships, we look at the mental aspect of it, we look at the emotional aspect of it, we look at your intuition and your spiritual connection, we look at ancestry and how that plays into a role from the genetic perspective, but also from the behavioral and mindset perspective, because we tend to pass down um, different health habits generation to generation, especially like, let's say the impact of slavery, you know, the the black community, especially in this country, tends to have a high fat diet. Well, that is a direct impact of slavery. We look at, you know, the European culture and we look at, you know, let's say their, you know, fascination with cheese and things like that, you know, super high fat as well. Um, and so there's a lot of these different and also too, in the European culture, they tend to disassociate a lot and not really want to face um, what is going on. And that's just kind of genetic and a part of different traumas and things like that. So we do look even on that level as well, and how that impacts both on a cellular level, as well as in the DNA. Okay. So when would you abandon holistic treatment for like medication? Is there ever a time where you would tell a patient, look, I think you should probably take this medication? So it's not my role to prescribe medication. Um, I can tell you that I'm very integrative. So I'm an integrative doctor. So I work alongside allopathic doctors. So um, patients sometimes will come to me looking for the Hail Mary, right? And what I mean by that is they have a lot of self-neglect. They've been to a lot of doctors. Let's say they have a tumor or something that's fast growing, right? And then they come to me and because I'm a scientist, I look at the case. I look at the diagnostics. I look at, you know, if they have MRI, CTs, et cetera. I look at their lab work. I look at the chart notes from the other doctor. And sometimes I have to say, you know what? This is a very fast growing tumor. In order to save your life, I need you to go back to your allopath. I need you to go to an oncologist. I'm going to refer you to one. We need to go with whatever their recommended treatment is. And then once you get to a certain point, then we can come back and kind of you know, reassess even during that process, even though we don't detox during active chemo or active um, oncology treatments, you know, we do focus on the nutrition and keeping the nutrition up. So there's a lot of integrative approaches. Um, it's not a, we're not alternative doctors as it is, as thought before, like there's not a um, this or that, right? Like you don't have to choose one or the other. Um, we really work together very seamlessly. And that only happens if the provider has a deep understanding of um, naturopathy in and of itself in its purest form and how allopathy works with it. Some of the older, more traditional naturopaths, the ones that don't have as much of the bioscience training, they just have more of like a certificate. They're trained more in alternative medicine, meaning that there's no no diagnostic or no scientific backing to what they're doing. They would just kind of give you an herb or give you a supplement or something like that. The, the type of naturopath that I am is far more sophisticated in the sense that we're always using science. We're always using data to be able to gauge the treatment. And so I can look at a case and say, you know what, we need to do X, Y, and Z, or I can look at lab work and say, you know what, you haven't been diagnosed with this, but I need you to go to an endocrinologist because you have, I think you have Graves disease. Um, and so go to this particular endocrinologist and let me know what they say, you know, or I need you to get your parathyroid checked because your calcium is elevated and it's maintained elevation, things like that. You know, there, there's a lot of nuance and subtlety, but in no time do I feel like people have to choose one or the other. Um, we, we all serve a purpose. I'm more of a specialist, um, similar to, let's say it, um, you know, a cardiologist or in, um, an endocrinologist or an internal medicine. So I'm just a specialist in the world of natural health care. Hmm, I like that. Yeah. All right. So what struggles would you say you face as an entrepreneur in holistic medicine? I think the miseducation is, um, I think one of the biggest challenges. I think people, um, think they know what holistic healthcare is and they think they know what natural healthcare is. So you're kind of, you know, 
fighting through that. And then also just when you're working with people on change and the resistance that, that people come up, you know, people don't typically come to me when they're well, unfortunately, um, or when they have healthy habits, unfortunately, they typically come to me after they have exhausted all options, or they've been to every doctor underneath the sun. um, And they're really very, very unwell. And so um, some of which when they come in, don't necessarily trust doctors, um, haven't been to a doctor in a long time, are afraid of doctors. And so um, there's a lot of nuance when it comes to that in terms of Uh, there's a very small margin of error and I really have to work at earning their trust, um, which can be definitely challenging. Yeah, I'm sure. So what is your most impressive case to date regarding a patient that came in with a problem that you were able to mitigate and kind of help them get back to a healthy place? Yeah, I mean, that, that's such a hard um, question. And, and here's why. So I've, I've treated over 30,000 people and each person is so unique, right? And also having all of that, the experiences of working with so many different people, like, you know, working with people that have, you know, diarrhea, like 20, 30 times a day and getting them down to having normal stools, right? <laughs> like, you know, like they can't even leave their house to, you know, people with, you know, thyroid conditions, like severe autoimmune thyroid conditions that finally get to wean down um, off of their medication, like to very, very minimal degree, maybe not completely, but very low amounts to, um, you know, people being able to, if, if they didn't come to me and have me intervene, um, you know, they necessarily wouldn't have been able to work integratively with me and their oncologist to defeat their, their cancer, you know, because they had given up on all treatment and just said, you know what, I, I'm not interested in this and, and working with me and trusting me enough to help me guide them through an integrative healthcare process. Um, I think even neurologically, I've worked with children that have been on tons of different psychotropic medications to the point even of being suicidal when you have, you know, an eight-year-old child, you know, pulling knives on their parents because of all the different psychotropic medications and me having to come in and neutralize all the medications and say, you know what, um, psychiatrist A, B, and C, if you do not pull this patient off of these particular medications and allow me to do my work, I'm going to have to step off this case because this is not healthy for this little child, especially in developmental state. And in that particular case, you know, she's doing a thousand times better. She's been my patient since she was three years old. Um, and you know, she's just this amazing, bright, uh, you know, joyful, happy child now. Um, and I've had, I've been able to watch her through a transformation, you know, um, coming in with skin reactions, um, severe skin reactions as, as children, as babies and being able to get them to their skin, to be able to heal. Um, even having, um, adults that have had severe skin issues and have been treated, um, over years with lots of steroids and they come in and they can barely walk and, you know, having to manage children and things like that and working with them slowly and gently getting them back to health and getting, getting their health back to restoration. I mean, like I said, I have so many cases of so many incredible stories. Um, and I'm very, very grateful to be able to, um, watch these people transform their lives using the power of nature. Well, I love that. I love that you've had so many amazing stories where most of your cases are impressive because you've been able to um, get the results that you're looking for. So that's, that's great. I love that. I'm glad that it's not just like Oh, I had two cases, you know? No, no. And, and, and again, it's like, you know, I'm just a guide and a teacher. So, you know, the, the patients that I mentioned, they, they listened to me, they trusted me, they did the work, you know, even if I said like, do crazy stuff, right. That they didn't understand. They were like, okay, you know, like, they really trusted in the process and trusted in my ability to guide them through um, these uncharted waters with them. And so I think it really, it's, it's not necessarily about me. It's about them and their faith and their willingness um, for them to get better. Um, and that is really what drove them and got them to the place that, that they are today. 
That's awesome. So um, do you take uh, medical insurance? So we decided back when the healthcare reform first kind of started that it didn't make sense for us to take insurance. And here's why we're teaching people to be personally responsible for their health, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm teaching you to be personally responsible for your health. And then you're coming in and having someone else pay for it, right? So what that, what that did was it was a lot of no-shows. It was a lot of overbooking. It was like 15 minute in and out. It was very, very stressful. I was stressed as a provider. They were stressed as a patient. And um, the insurance companies were very difficult to work with. Um, and they're difficult to work with no matter what letters I have behind my name. So it doesn't matter if it's an ND, if it's an MD, if it's a DO, if it's an LP, whatever. It doesn't matter. Um, the insurance companies truly drive healthcare in this country. Um, and uh, sadly, and so I decided to kind of step out of that in 2012 and become a concierge doctor. So I'm a private doctor. I'm a flat fee doctor. And that way I take the health insurance company out of the middle of my relationship with the patient. And a lot of people don't realize that insurance company drives patient health care, meaning that if I'm billing insurance, I have to follow their rules, which means if you come in and you need certain treatment, the insurance company is going to say, uh, 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 you can't get this treatment unless you do A, B, and C, or no, we're going to deny you for this PET scan. You know, you don't really need that. And then you have to go back and forth and you really have to fight and advocate for your patient. And so, and then too, the cost and the spending, especially with healthcare reform, um, you know, it had some good, good uh, perspectives in terms of like, you know, um, what is it pre-existing conditions, but in a lot of ways, you know, it really elevated all of our cost of health insurance and healthcare in this country. There's a lot of fat put into those bills. And so, you know, we really wanted to get out of that and really wanted to make an affordable healthcare practice, but one that people take full personal responsibility for um, financially and otherwise. Now, with that being said, we do accept HSA and FSA accounts. Those are health spending accounts and flex spending accounts, which are offered in conjunction with your health insurance. So you can actually plan for your health care. So it's more proactive. A lot of times people don't realize health insurance is actually there for catastrophic emergency. Like in the event that there's an accident, it's not there to prevent things. So like if for instance, I wouldn't call Geico and say, you know what, I need new tires on my car. I need an oil change. I need some new spark plugs. Can you help me out? Like they would laugh on the phone. Right. But if I get in an accident, they're going to be there to, you know, cover the cost of my rental, cover the damages, cover, you know, my medical, if I'm injured, et cetera. And so they're has to be a paradigm shift in terms of what insurance is for, what it's made for, and um, patients' responsibility in their health care. And so for those reasons, I do not accept health insurance. We do accept it for lab work because um, that's pretty simple. It's, you know, I need the diagnostics, that kind of thing. Um, and then there's other things too where I say, you know, we could probably get this covered under the insurance, but I'm going to have you go to your primary care instead and have them do this, that, whatever. So, um, you know, there's, there's pros and cons to all of that. Yeah. I, I, I've heard that before. And plus, even I have experienced it with needing to get a certain um, procedure or just an x-ray done and I had to wait weeks for the insurance company to approve it. Meanwhile, now my doctor needs to get this x-ray done to see what's going on inside so she can make decisions, right? So oh, yeah. It's so ridiculous. Um, yeah. And, and if you go into other countries with socialized medicine, it's even worse. Um, you know, I think romantically, it sounds good. Everybody, you know, free healthcare, you know, I mean, it sounds good. But then once you look at the actual hard numbers, and you look at realistically, it doesn't really work when you have a whole bunch of people receiving service, and then, you know, the doctors not being valid, validated and paid well, and they're being over you know, over um, extended, you're not necessarily going to get um, quality of care. And also too, your wait times are going to go up significantly. Yeah, that's definitely true. I think there's a lot to kind of figure out, but 
the fact that you can get health care is better than not being able to get it at all. <laughs> but that's exactly. like a conversation. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> so mm-hmm. how do you feel about CBD and medicinal marijuana? Do you support those types of um, treatment or? Yeah, I mean, they have they have distinct purposes. They're not cure-alls for everything. Um, I think people, people think, oh, yeah, I'm just going to use it for every, you know, I break a bone, I'm going to throw some CBD on, you know, or whatever, right? And so um, clinically speaking, you know, CBD and TSA, THC, excuse me, um, does work on the endocannabinoid system within the body, which is uh, somewhat attached to the nervous system as well as the immune system. So the CBD component of the marijuana marijuana plant um, is very helpful for um, post-traumatic stress, anxiety, um, also inflammation at higher doses and pain management. Now the THC component of it is very helpful for, um, you know, tumor regression and things like that. And so um, it's really understanding the practical application of it. Now, if let's say you're talking about, you know, smoking it, for instance, you know, I'm not a big proponent of smoking anything, um, because of course you're going to deoxygenate your cells. Um, and then two, if you take it too much, um, you know, it can send your neurotransmitters into more of a depressive state. So you have to be mindful for the application of that as well. Um, so, but topical agents are really, really helpful as long as they're of good quality, because, you know, like, you know, every, every person under the sun sells CBD now. So you really have to be mindful of the quality that you get. Um, you know, I definitely recommend you getting it more from a doctor than a, you know, a natural healthcare doctor like myself, rather than let's say an allopath, not that you, they can't prescribe it, but you know, we're going to know a little bit more about the qualities of it. Um, I'm an advocate for anything natural and the use of anything that's, um, on, you know, naturally occurring substance, but I also use it as medicine. So it's it's not like, you know, I'm just using it to relax on a Friday night. So there's reasons behind it. So share a secret with us about holistic medicine, something we probably should know, but don't know. Hmm. A secret about holistic medicine, um, that you can't get your degree off Google. <laughs> <laughs> That, um, you know, like I read stuff in books instead of watch 10,000 hours of YouTube, Um, (laughs) you know, Um, yeah, I think just to that point, I think um, there is a lot to it. There's a lot of science to it. There's a lot of time and diligence. Um, Like I said, I've been in natural healthcare for 19 years. I went to a lot of school and education to do that, to do what I do. There's a lot of subtlety to it as well. Um, and you know, you don't necessarily get that it's, it's a good combination of science and intuition, but we're not just like supplement pushers. Like you, you can't just, you can't take an allopathic model, meaning like a diagnose and manage model and apply it to natural healthcare. Meaning I can't go, Oh, I have X, Y, Z condition. Oh, let me go look up online. What natural thing will fix that? Um, because that's not treating the cause, it's just treating the symptom. Um, and I think people think that that is natural health care. And yeah, you know, you're, you're, you're using a naturally occurring substance, right? But you're not necessarily allowing the body to fully heal um, properly. And, and those, those causatives that are driving the bus of people's um, imbalance of health, they really come at those deeper levels and they're stored deeper in the tissues. And so having someone who's experienced and knowledgeable to evaluate laboratory and look at the diagnostics and then guide a person through step-by-step because there is a process to which the body heals itself and you have to respect that process. Otherwise you're just going to constantly be managing symptoms. You'll just, you know, you're like, oh, there's an oil for that. Oh, there, you know, there's this for that, you know, and 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 I think that's really good for people that are just getting into natural health care. Um, but people that have been in it for a long time and people understand it, re- recognize that there's a lot more depth to it than just, you know, slapping an oil on something. Yeah, definitely. So what are your thoughts on the COVID vaccine? Um, my thoughts on the COVID vaccine are that 
Um, it has not been tested long periods of time. Um, I also am a little concerned about how it's going to impact people genetically um, and not having ever used this particular delivery system before. Um, and also the concern that there's a high amount of toxicity already within our environment. And we have micro doses of toxins that are bioaccumulating in the body and um, meaning that they're just kind of building up and the impact of that on the nervous system. And then now you're injecting something that is in, in, in a lot of res respect there to mimic the immune system, I'm just concerned about creating not only allergic responses, um, which have been reported, but also creating autoimmune conditions, which we're also kind of fighting an uphill battle right now, just because of the level of toxicity and the lack of nutrients within our food supply um, as it is currently. So, you know, we have some challenges with that. Um, you know, um, natural immunity is one thing and artificial immunity is another thing. So there's two types of immunity. Natural immunity is when, you know, let's say you have COVID, I have COVID and, or you have COVID, I catch COVID from you. Right. Um, and now I build natural immunity. Right. Um, and artificial immunity is more of, OK, I'm going to get a vaccine in order to, uh, you know, trigger the body's immune system to be able to defend itself in the event that it gets exposed. Um, I'm concerned that it's not FDA approved. Um, I'm concerned that there are no long term clinical trials. Um, I'm concerned that the people that are kind of testing this thing out, um, you know, what health implications that they're going to have long term, not to mention in our DNA um, and what's going to happen to future generations as well, because we're already seeing um, lots of toxicity actually going into the DNA. Of course, this is not quote unquote scientifically proven because they dismiss genetics and methyl genetics so far in our um, society as a, as a um, form of, um, of uh, diagnostic. However, from what I've seen in the methyl genetics, we've got a lot of instabilities um, within the genetic code, specifically around handling this amount of toxic agents that the body's being exposed to. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm a naturalist, you know, I'm all about allowing the body to heal itself. I, I believe that God gave us an immune system and that I believe that he kind of knew what he was doing. I don't necessarily think that humans have a really good track record of trying to do better than God. And so I think that when we start to act like God, we start to uh, create more consequences for ourselves that we have yet to be able to really experience and see. Yeah. Uh, I, I agree. So do you, with the work that you're doing, do you feel like you're doing purpose-driven work? And if yes, share a moment that made you feel like this is definitely purpose-driven for me, or like, this is the work that I'm supposed to be doing in my life. Um, gosh, let's see. Well, I definitely feel like I'm purpose-driven. I feel like in a lot of ways, I feel like my, my life is not my own because I feel like it's so purpose-driven, right? Yeah. Um, so I have to kind of carve out my own life in the midst of this big mission and, you know, that I have, uh, you know, for the world to be able to embrace natural health care and understand it. Um, I would say most recently, you know, I getting into legislation and um, really educating legislators about natural health care. Um, and about the importance of natural health care. And I, I formulated a bill here in Virginia. Um, unfortunately, it, it, it died in the subcommittee. However, when I first got the bill, um, it was very breathtaking because I was like, wow, like this took a year for me to get this right done and um, to just see it in real life and to see what I created to be able to stand for the thousands of patients that I treat. Um, that really felt good that I felt like I was doing the work necessary to really give people that don't, don't have a voice or their voice is not educated. You know, my, when I go and I speak in front of legislators and when I speak publicly, you know, I'm speaking from a very practical and objective educated format. And I'm saying things that, you know, my patients would love to be able to articulate, but unfortunately don't have the training or understanding. That's why they have me, right? Mm -hmm. And so to be able to give so many people and so many moms, especially because I represent a lot of families, I treat a lot of um, families in my 
practice um, to be able to be their voice um, and to stand up for them. I mean, it's just remarkable. And I'm very grateful every day that I get the opportunity to do that. Nice. So share an oh hell no moment with us that changed your perspective on something or that actually changed your life. Gosh, an oh hell no. I would say, so um, I was not always this focused, right? Um, I was rather rebellious. Um, and, uh, you know, I was going to college and um, I was kind of, you know, new in college. And I was like, you know, I'm just, you know, I, you know, God wants me to be a doctor. I don't want to be a doctor. I, you know, I just want to be a musician. I'm, I'm actually a folk musician. Right. And I decided that I was going to, um, ch- I changed my major. I went to college for music, you know, for a little bit for like a semester. And I, um, I took off of um, school and uh, I was going to go to um, Hawaii and go write my first album. And, um, you know, it was so fascinating because, um, I am not, I'm I'm not really good at getting on planes on time. Right. I've like had a string of these things where I just like, I don't know what happens. And so I was late for the plane. And so I was driving my car in the desert. Um, I lived in Arizona at the time and I was driving like crazy fast and I blew a tire and rolled my car and uh, broke my neck. And I woke up two weeks later, um, needless to say, I missed the plane. I took the helicopter instead to the nearest hospital in Vegas. And I woke up with this concussion and a halo, um, on my head. And so, you know, of course, like the drugs were off and I was like, you know, well, initially I was like, I don't want, you know, the nurse comes in. I'm like, I don't want that stuff. You know, like I was all whatever. And then they wore off and I was like, oh my God, you know? And so, you know, bring it back, bring it back. And so, um, you know, I sat there for 12 weeks and, you know, I'm going to tell you daytime TV is sobering. And, you know, I call that whole time of my life, God's timeout. And that truly was my, oh, hell no moment because I kept going to the doctor and I just wanted some empathy. I wanted some compassion. I was a super active. I was like a rock climber and a trail runner and all these things. I couldn't even play the guitar. I couldn't work. I had this like erector set drilled into my skull and, um, and I had to be on all these drugs all day in order to just, you know, maintain my pain. And so I decided that, once I got out of, you know, that erector set that they put me in, I don't even understand why that thing has not advanced, but I digress. So once I got out of it, I said, I actually bought a PT cruiser so I could learn how to drive my car slow. And I drove back to California and I took a job and I went back to school to be a doctor because I really wanted to change the face of healthcare. I really wanted to create a practice where people cared about other people. Like the only thing that those, and they were top neurosurgeons, incredible in their field. But the only thing they could say is, you know, you're lucky to be alive. Do you want to refill in your medication? Right. And so I just needed a little bit more of like, you're going to be okay. And, you know, hold my hand and you're going to get through this. And just a little cheerleading could have probably got me a little bit farther. Again, not an obedient patient after 12 weeks, I took a wrench and I unscrewed the thing and I was just done. I was like, okay, that we're, what are we going to do? You confuse my neck, whatever you want to do. And I need to get back to my life now. <laughs> oh my gosh. Wow. That's like a really good, oh hell no moment. <laughs> right? <laughs> what a change, you know, like that changed the entire, you know, like trajectory of your life. Like you were going to make your album girl. And then <laughs> I was going to do it, man. I had, I had a little woofing farm already picked out. I was going to like by day be picking organic vegetables and writing my music with my guitar at night. I mean, I, I had, it was, I had all this like backpacking equipment. Like I I was serious. (laughs) Amazing. Well, I'm glad, no, I'm not glad that you had the accident, but I'm glad that you found this passion and you're able to help people, you know, um, get on a healthy track and take care of themselves. So um, please tell us how we can connect with you, um, where we can learn about your practice, and if you have a blog or anything like that. Yes, of course. So um, my website for my practice is holisticfamilypracticeva.com. I'm on all the social, so I'm on, um, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on, you know, Dr. Erica Steele, I'm on excuse me, YouTube. I'm on um, Instagram, Facebook, and I'm also on um, 
Facebook and Instagram is Dr. Erica Steele. And that's more of like my public speaking and my legislative work. Um, it's a little separate, but equal to my practice. So um, yeah, so Dr. Erica Steele and uh, holisticfamilypracticeva.com. Nice. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. This has been so much fun. Definitely. The F-150 Lightning, the E-Transit van, three of America's most iconic popular vehicles. They've been fully electrified, and they're making the revolutionary feel familiar. We've got a feeling they'll help make electric vehicles even more popular for all Americans. Call it a hunch. Ford Electric Vehicles, built for America, built Ford Proud. At T-Mobile for Business, unconventional thinking means we see things differently so you can focus on what matters most. That's why we've become the leader in 5G, number one in customer satisfaction, and a partner who includes 5G in every plan so you get it all. Unconventional thinking is better for business. Open Signal awards T-Mobile as America's fastest 5G network USA. 5G user experience report July 2021. Capable device required. Coverage not available in some areas. Some uses may require certain plan features. See T-Mobile.com. For J.D. Power 2020 award information, visit jdpower.com awards.